Hi everyone, my name is Diogo Marquez, your friend in sales. Today's guest is Neil Schaefer. Neil, welcome to the show. Tell our audience a little bit more about yourself and what you do. I am a digital and social media marketing author, consultant, speaker. Uh, I actually teach executives at a few universities. Uh, I, I'm based here in the United States. You could probably tell from my accent. So I teach at Rutgers Business School as well as in Ireland. I go to every year to teach at the Irish Management Institute. Uh, written a few books. My latest actually just came out last week, sort of bad timing because of the uh, coronavirus. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it's called The Age of Influence. And it's all about uh, how and why every business should leverage influencers. Where we are right now, especially due to the terms imposed by the current pandemic, I would like to hear some of your thoughts regarding the power of social media, especially for face-to-face -face agents. Sure. So, you know, vis-a-vis -vis influencer marketing is one strategy, but just in general, right, what the, you know, people are still spending money. They're not spending it on, they're not taking trips, they're not buying cars, but um, money is being spent. So what you need to do for your business is obviously understand how this pandemic has shifted the behavior in your target customer. Uh, undoubtedly, one trend that we see, and we've been seeing this for some time, is a new, a further increased shift towards digital. So, you know, your uh, fitness gym might have closed down, but if you were doing online courses or doing one-to-one -one online training using Zoom or Skype or what have you, there is obviously still money to be made because people still need to stay in shape. So do you have a digital product or service? That is the number one thing. And if you do, um, you, the, the impact is a little bit less. Obviously, you know, here in the United States uh, last week or this week, I should say, we had 3 million people in one week, new claims for unemployment. So um, that being said, uh, people, you know, we, we've seen this before, actually. Uh, we saw it with every financial crisis, there are shifts in the economy. So the United States and, and maybe a lot of Western Europe used to be major manufacturers and then all that production was shifted overseas, a lot to China and what have you. So we're sort of seeing a similar type of shift and it requires us all to pivot. But where do we pivot? The number one thing we need to understand is we need to have digital products and services at least in temporarily to supplement if, if we can't get that foot traffic. But also this is really a great time if you are doing marketing not to be overly promoting yourself, but to help other people. People are lonely, people are looking for information, they're looking for free resources, and no matter what type of business you have, you can contribute to your local community. Um, and we're seeing a lot of even big brands, you know, encouraging social distance, what have you. But this is another um, thing that, you know, find what works for your community, but find some way to tap in and, and, and really help people. And I think that, you know, doing these two things, and, and what I mean by help people is you're developing relationships, right? Because people buy from people they, they know, like, and trust. So vis-a-vis -vis influencer marketing specifically, use, you may not be doing new influencer campaigns, but you can use the time to really um, develop those relationships with influencers so that when the time comes, then you'll be able to launch campaigns with them. So, um, you know, even though we're virtual, there's a lot that we can be doing. Number one, look at your product or service. Number two, deepen relationships with people in your community, your customers and influencers. It's easy to understand that you need to build yourself as a figure of authority. You build a product and then you're following, they start buying from you. But this is an holistic view. This is an holistic approach because it takes a bunch of work to get this going on a consistent basis. Well, actually building a digital presence is it does not take i mean diogo you've you've been in online marketing so you know put up a website uh allow people to download i mean obviously creating a digital product or service might be a little bit hard um but you know putting up a website and uh allowing people to download or get access to that service is is really not that difficult to do um i know in terms of digital courses there are platforms like Teachable or Thinkific that are, are fantastic platforms that basically allow you to upload content and then create a landing page and then sell that content. Uh, and that's what most of these um, 
big bloggers and, and, and so forth do. So that's a really, really easy thing to do. And the interesting thing is, you know, Facebook has already warned that their ad revenue is going to take a hit. So people are more than ever on social media, but they're just not clicking on ads, right? But what this means to me is I see opportunity that, well, if Facebook ad revenues are going down and all these big brands, one of my clients, I mean, they can't ship product. They only have physical product. So they literally have to close their warehouse because of this lockdown here in the state of California at least. So for the next month, they can't ship product. It doesn't make sense for them to do Facebook ads or Instagram ads for the next month. So they put a pause on it. And a lot of businesses are doing this. This means if you understand the way that, you know, advertising works, that there is more supply than demand and prices will come down. So you may find, and I've yet to do a lot of experimentation, but you may find actually from an advertising perspective, it might be a lot cheaper than you thought. And it might be a lot more effective than you thought, especially if it taps into what your target customer, your target user is going through right now. So I could sit here. Um, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about influencer marketing. I'm going to, I'm going to go through a presentation. I'm going to spend two hours. I'm going to use iMovie and I'm going to cut those into 10 minute modules. I'm going to upload those to teachable. I'm going to create a landing page and then I'm going to send out a newsletter to all my customers. I could do this in 24 hours if I wanted to. Um, I have a lot of stuff on my plate having come out with this new book, but it, it is possible. It's, it's digital. Really, anything is possible. The hard part is figuring out that product and service and then finding a way to deliver it. But even you know, e-commerce platforms like Shopify do allow you to provide you know, digital services. So at the very least, it doesn't have to take a lot of time, simplify it, but you need to find that product or service and you need to create it. I think that's what's going to take time here. But once you have it, the delivery because it's digital, it's, it, it's immediate. It's immediate download, immediate access. So it, it can be very, very quick. At this time, I started to get much more aggressive on Facebook and Google ads. It's a supply and demand thing now. I would like to hear some of your thoughts regarding testing and combinations. So my background is B2B sales. Uh, and I had a, I had carried a quota every quarter and uh, I was only as good as my last quarter sales. So I, I come from that. It was, in te- it was in technology, right? It was in you know, semiconductors and embedded software. And it was all in Asia. I, I speak Japanese and Chinese. And I love that abushido. I can read that, the Chinese characters behind you. So that, that's sort of my background. And then I, you know, I, I had to do a lot of things, wear a lot of hats. I, I got involved with marketing. And, and when I started social media back in 2008, you know, salespeople were not using social media, but marketers realized it was a great way to reach people. So I did a lot more work with, you know, with social media marketing and then salespeople are, are, are slowly catching up. So um, it's interesting when I talk about influence, I'm going to get back to your question. When I talk about influencer marketing, I think that salespeople can do it better because it requires one-to-one relationship building. Whereas marketers are used to just say one thing and, you know, spray and pray to everybody. Um, I agree. But, but the, the, the marketing in terms of like, you know, how do we optimize ad spend in general? It comes down to experimentation. And maybe a really, really good way of of looking at this is you have a pipeline and you have 50 people in the pipeline. You know they're not all going to convert, right? You're only going to, you know, only 10 of them may return your call. So it's a numbers game. So the way that the ad system works is it's a numbers game as well. And what, what the ad system, whether it's Facebook or Google or Twitter or LinkedIn or anybody, what they're really doing is they're looking for ads that perform well. Because if your ad performs well, they want to keep showing it to more and more people because it allows them to generate revenue and not seem like spam. So if you find a sales process that works really well, you're going to keep replicating and replicating it because your conversion rate is going to go up. You're going to find a more efficient use of time. So in a similar way, Facebook says, okay, you give me one ad, you give me one target, one text, one image, I'm going to publish it. But if you were to give two, inevitably one is going to work better than another. If you were to experiment with two different sales processes, one's going to work better than the other. If you were to go to two different sort of networking meetings, you're probably going to find more prospects at one than the other. And guess what? You're going to spend more time at the meetings that provide you more prospects, right? So, or you try LinkedIn and Facebook. LinkedIn gives you more prospects. You're going to spend more time on LinkedIn. It's the same thing. But with ads, you can scale. As a person, you can only go to so many meetings or only have so many sales processes. But with Facebook, every variation is unique. So if you had, um, you know, you were targeting people, let's say I was targeting people in Chicago, LA, and New York, right? And I had three different images and three different texts. 
So I had, you know, what's this, like 27 different variations. I don't know what the math would be. But basically what it's doing is every one of those, it is sending out to those audiences. And those that perform better, it is actually making cheaper cost per click. Those that do not perform as well actually get more expensive. So the better your ads are, the, the cheaper your conversions become, but you need to test different things in order to be able to find that cheap variation, if that makes sense. So in the past, it was very, very difficult to do this on Facebook. Now they actually have this automatic optimization. So you give them the variations, you start the campaign, and it will automatically you know, shift more budget to those better performing keywords. It's a win-win. It's a, you know, Facebook gets ad revenue because people are clicking on it and you want to spend more with Facebook because you're getting great cost per conversion. So that's really the thought process there. If you've only, you know, tried one thing, you want to try multiple ads, right? Multiple text, multiple visuals, and definitely different types of targeting. So in my world of, of social media marketing, there's a lot of different ways to target people on Facebook. You have the interest, right? People are interested in something. You have targeting people that like your competitor's page. You have targeting people that like your own page. And then you have something on custom audiences, right? So um, custom audiences, you know, at, at a minimum, we can upload our email database and target those people. Um, but we can also create uh, different custom audiences. We, you know, one type is called a lookalike audience. So here are our fans. And Facebook will say, we're going to analyze those fans and make a pool of people that you can advertise to that are lookalikes of those fans. They're very similar. We think that they're going to convert well, right? We can make a lookalike of our email audience and we can make custom audiences for our website visitors. We can make custom audiences for people that engage with our posts or saw our videos. So you can go absolutely crazy trying to find the right target. But here's the thing, if you're not experimenting and trying you know, a few of these, you're never going to get the best results. So I hope that all makes sense to you. If you've done Facebook ads for a while, it probably does. If you're still new, it is, it is very complex. It is more complex than just a Google ad, in my opinion. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to optimize. And you're never going to know what's best for your market until you do these, because everybody's going to get different results, because our audiences and our, our products, our visuals, they're all different. Would you do Google and Facebook and LinkedIn? Because these are three giants. Yeah, so I believe, um, I believe in A-B testing everything. I believe in comparing everything. So if you're doing Facebook ads, you might want to experiment with Google ads to see if you get better performance. The beautiful thing is, you know, these ad platforms, once you create the ad, within 24 hours, you're going to get a feel in terms of cost per click, cost per conversion. You also have to remember, people use social media differently than they use Google. So if I'm in sales, I want to have all my bases covered. Okay. So digitally speaking, the major bases are number one, social media, because we spend our most time there. So that includes organic social media, as well as ads, if, in case they don't see our organic posts, which very few do these days. Um, it also means people still read emails, believe it or not. So we have email marketing, marketing automation, which is still very powerful. We then have people do searches on the internet. So that's why you need to be on search engines. And organically, that means content marketing and blog posts, what have you. From a paid perspective, it means paying Google, obviously, to show your ads. So I believe you need to have all three covered in, in order to be successful. There are some that just do social media to do well or some that just do you know, blog content and do well on Google. Um, but really, the, the, all three can work together because you, you create content on your blog, you share it on social media, and you, when people come to your website to read the blog from social media, you have some sort of free download or lead magnet that they opt into to fuel your email marketing automation. And then you, you're, you're in touch with them, you know, weekly. Because at the end of the day, in order to convert someone, you need, what, 10 touches, 15 touches, however many it is. And email gives you those, those additional touches on a regular basis. So, yes, I would experiment, you know, Google because people are searching for something. I have a client of mine and they sell like an IT software. And right now we're just doing Google. And I'm like, it makes sense because, you know, if people are searching for a solution that you have, they're going to Google looking to do research to buy something. Social media, very different. They're not there to buy stuff, but you might be able to interest them if you show them the right thing to the right person at the right time. And I'm sure we've all had instances, maybe we were on Facebook, we clicked on an ad or on Instagram, we clicked on something. We still do, right? Um, but they're not there to buy. Whereas in Google, they are there you know, Amazon even more so, but, but I, you know, that, that, that's beyond that. Right. Um, now with social media, you have Facebook, 
you have Twitter, you have LinkedIn, you have Instagram, which is done through Facebook, you have Pinterest. So, and even within Google, we have YouTube as well. So each one of these channels is gonna perform differently, right? And each one has different targeting options. If you wanna target people in large enterprises, LinkedIn will allow you to target people who work at companies because they put that on their profile. You cannot do that anywhere else, right? Um, Twitter is a network where people are very used to clicking on links. It is a clicking culture. Not everybody does that from Facebook, right? But people on Twitter will do that. So if you want to generate a lot of a lot of clicks, I highly recommend, and, and your demographic is on Twitter, I, I highly recommend that. But whether you're on Twitter or LinkedIn or not, you're probably on Facebook, which makes it very attractive, especially for older audiences. If it's a younger audience, you know, Instagram obviously is, is becoming the major platform there. Um, but you're going to get different results. It's a different demographic, different targeting options. Um, you know, Facebook obviously has very powerful options, but LinkedIn, because you can target people that have, you know, the titles of VP marketing or VP sales or that work at, you know, Coca-Cola or whatever company. Uh, it's so if you're selling to companies, you're selling to large organizations or, or you know, people within companies with certain titles, you can really micro target those people on LinkedIn. It's going to be more expensive, but the average, you know, income of people uh, on LinkedIn is much higher than Facebook as well. So you sort of get what you pay for, but you, you don't know, you know, it's all about experimentation. And when I created my first social media strategy for a client back in 2010, I picked up on something I learned in Japan, which is called the Deming Circle. And the Deming Circle is a framework for experiments that was created by a gentleman named Professor Edwards Deming, who's considered the godfather of quality control. And he's an American, but he's not well known here, but he's like a hero in Japan because all of the Japanese manufacturers adopted all of his practices. And that's how Toyota and, and you know, Sony, and they all became these massive manufacturers at, at, with high quality at low cost. And what, what the Deming Circle says is, you know, whenever you do an experiment, you need to plan the experiment, you do it, you check it, and then you optimize. It's also called PDCA or Plan, Do, Check, Act, right? And it's a never-ending circle of Kaizen optimization. And I can think of no better way to describe social media because you never know what results you're going to get until you show up and you start engaging with others and, and posting content and the exact same thing is with ads. The only rational way to approach this is it's an experiment, but you want to control it, right? You want to plan it, go according to plan, look at the data, and you're right, Yoga, it requires a lot of data to figure this out, but always optimize. So you're never going to get, you know, there's also like with Facebook ads, they're seasonal. So, you know, November, December, brands spend a huge amount of money on Facebook ads, your costs are going to go up. So there's some things you can't control, but you can get this data and continually optimize and optimize and optimize and try to find ways to get it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And using a LinkedIn versus a Facebook or a Twitter versus LinkedIn versus Facebook gives you more data to say, you know what? I thought Facebook was expensive, but Twitter and LinkedIn were even more expensive. We're going to stick with Facebook. Something like that. that, that that's the way that, that marketers are trying to manage the mayhem or, or you know, the mess that's out there. Um, and I think that this sort of analytical mindset is really critical today because even if you're in sales, if you're selling to a lot of people, and you start getting the same sort of concerns from people, you need that data, right? You need, to, you need to sort of feedback into your own system, into your product of how you want to sell better, right? You want to be able to sell more by doing less. Um, and so you need to optimize your own activities as if you're advertising on Facebook. So I, I, that's why at my company, which was a semiconductor manufacturer, we all had to learn those principles of the PDCA because they're pliable to anything you do in life, really. Um, but, but so if you consider it all an experiment, I think it's the right mindset to have. You don't need to know what works at first. You, you can't know, but you won't know until you try and you collect the data. And most importantly, you continue to look at the data and optimize and optimize and optimize. I'm a life insurance agent. So obviously my product is life insurance. Would you target people interested in life insurance with organic content? And then the one that starts to pick off, you start changing it to paid ads? Yeah, so let's take a step back. Actually, one of my clients for my social selling training is an insurance company. I think when it comes down to something that's sort of sensitive um, and financial, um, it really requires that, that relationship is more important than in most sales activities, right? Um, so, you know, that's an area where you really need to develop relationships. And, you know, my, my, my first, you know, point is before you even advertise, 
Are you meeting people? Now you got to meet more people virtually. Are you building a relationship where people are following you on social media, right? And if all you're doing is talking about life insurance, I don't think you're going to be as effective as if you were promoting yourself as a person, right? And really engaging with other people and um, getting people to like you, right? The like, know, and trust. So obviously I would also be publishing information about life insurance, but with regarding life insurance, there's a few different ways of looking at it, right? Depending on where you are in, in how old you are. So for some, it might be an investment if you're younger. When you're older, it might be protecting the family asset. So there's probably a few different ways. Hey, you're already investing in the stock market. Have you considered investing in life insurance? Or, hey, have you heard about the 10 new types of life insurance annuities? and how they have tax benefits. Yeah, maybe in the United States, I don't know. Um, so there's a lot of different angles, right, that you can take with that content specific to life insurance. But there's also this general, you know, in terms of Instagram, we call them like lifestyle influencers. There's also this part of, of, of you actually connecting with people on a human level and showing, you know, you're out with your family or you went to a great, well, some of this is gonna be hard to do now, but hey, you know, this morning I found at the supermarket, they had tons of toilet paper available. I mean, you know, whatever it is uh, for the times, building that relationship is really, really critical. So before you even advertise, because if you did advertise, people are gonna click on your page. And if you don't have like 50 or 100 fans, or, you know, they're, they're gonna go, who is this person? So I really think you should develop that community first and developing that community requires obviously engaging and getting people to know about your page. But I think if it's just about life insurance, you're really limiting yourself. Really, you're about, you know, whether it's protect, whatever your brand is, protecting your finances or whether you want to take that sort of investment aspect. Um, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. But I think when you take a little bit broader aspect and you provide a lot of information um, related to it, some directly, some indirectly, um, combined with personal things, I think that's the best combination. But vis-a-vis -vis ads, right, or groups, yes. So there, I, I talked about these different angles you have. Life insurance as an investment. Life insurance as a, to reduce your risk in terms of a, when there's a stock market crash. Um, life insurance for your grandchildren. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can, a lot of different perspectives. Each one of these perspectives would be a type of message that could be tested. So yes, you could once a week, right, uh, post one of those types of messages um, and into Facebook groups or your Facebook page and you can, you know, boost it on your Facebook page for five or 10 euros so it gets a little bit more exposure. Um, and you could do that once a week for, you can run one week campaigns, just five or 10 euros and try that with four different angles to the same audience. And I bet you that the results are gonna show you that some, uh, some people engage with more some people actually comment on more or like or click the link on more or like more. And that's the type of thing I'm talking about here is, um, you know, text, visual, you know, take that out. It's really the different angles you can take, the different perspectives to try to lure people in to, to, to become interested in you. But, you know, if you offer something of value, like a free consultation, you're going to be even more effective. Or if you offer a free one hour live stream, you know, every, we're going to, we're going to answer your questions about insurance investment every week, tune in on Facebook live or, or, or the podcast or whatever it is. These are other things that will encourage people to like your page or to click on the link. Right. Um, and, and that's, that, that would be sort of my, you know, we're sharing information about, you know, financial investments, including insurance, or we're, we're, you know, we want to be your one-stop shop for everything insurance, whether we provide it to you or not. We want to get your questions answered. Those are the types of resources I think that people are looking for. And that's, that's the way I'd position yourself from a content perspective. Okay, so when you get people start engaging, then you put the pedal to the metal and increase the ad spend. Yeah, then you start, you start going deeper into, huh, this topic really resonates with people. This seems to be converting. You go deeper. That's where you sort of niche down, right? You go deeper and deeper and deeper. And then you try to get that message now to more and more people, right? So deeper and deeper in the content, because the more as a salesperson, I always tell marketers, if you're trying to figure out what content to create, like for a blog or for Facebook, ask your salespeople, you're meeting the customer, right? those meetings may now be virtual, but you understand customer needs more than anyone in the organization. So by doing that and, and testing the content and actually talking to people afterwards, you're going to understand deeply. You're going to understand a lot of things 
a lot of triggers that made people click on that link or contact you. And now you need to be able to say, hey, you know, I talked to 10 people last week and eight people are, you know, when they realized what a great investment life insurance was, they actually shifted money from the stock market or from the bank to, to life insurance. You know, find out here why. I'm gonna do a free one hour webinar and have all your, you know, th that sort of thing. You get the data. You know, when I was in sales, it's like, well, you know, to be honest with you, five of the six top, you know, um, DVD recorder manufacturers are already using our software. You want to know why? You know, I'll, let me come in your office for an hour and do a demo. It's the same thing. So that data is very, very powerful, not just from sales, but from that content you can share in social, either organically uh, and or through boosting or through an ad. Let's say some guy is a CPA and the other one is a life insurance agent. Do you think it's a good idea to partner up and help the same audience from different perspectives. So partnering up with other influencers, do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, and it's funny because I started writing this book on influencer marketing, and then I went to do one of these social selling trainings for these insurance salespeople, and they were talking about centers of influence. I'm like, are, are you guys doing like, are you guys working with influencers? I'm, I'm like, tell me about the centers of influence, right? And they said exactly what you did. They said the centers of influence are people in our community that can help us get leads or that we can share leads with. So it's CPAs, it's bankers, it's trust lawyers, it's, it, it's this whole ecosystem of people that if you develop relationships with them, you can very well get leads from them or share leads with them, right? So if we take that virtually online, so th that form of influence exists, right? Regardless of social media, there are people in your community, there are influencers in your community, offline influencers that you should have relationships with. But we can now do this online. So, you know, it's funny, I spoke at a marketing conference before the lockdown earlier this, earlier this month. And uh, one of the examples I gave was Intuit. So Intuit is the maker of QuickBooks, which is the leading accounting software my business uses, I love it. And they have a program where they have QuickBooks resellers become the face of their brand. And I showed, a, I showed a screenshot of one of these CPAs on YouTube that uh, did a QuickBooks tutorial that got hundreds of thousands of views. And he had hundreds of thousands of YouTube subscribers as a CPA. Now that is an influencer that I would wanna work with and say, you know what? You have really, really broad reach. I have broad reach in life insurance. Let's do a mutual, let's do something mutual online right? Let's do a webinar. Let's do a mutual blog post. Come on my podcast and let's share it with our community. And that is, that is how you leverage influencers online. Now we need to move those people that have influence offline, find similar people that have influence online. And maybe they just have, you know, a thousand LinkedIn followers, but I don't know, right? They have like a thousand fans on Twitter. It, it's better than just doing it yourself. So when you collaborate with other people and you sort of cross pollinate, you know, between your followers and community, that's when it gets powerful, right? So then it's going to come down to that CPA may say, you know what, sorry, but I only work with other people if you pay me 500 euros or a thousand euros. And, and you're going to get that, right? So you don't have to work with the top echelon people, but find people that have a bigger community than you. Find, you know, reach out to them. Hey, you know, with the coronavirus, I'm looking to do more online. I'm still selling life insurance. I know that you're, uh, you know, I know that um, CPAs often recommend life insurance. And I like to find a way where we can collaborate and, um, you know, sell each other services through a webinar or something. Um, and that would be the approach I'd recommend for everybody listening to this. Find online influencers. If you have offline referral sources of leads, find people that are doing the same thing online, find ways to collaborate with them. This is a great thing you can be doing right now with this pandemic to really move your business forward. For my first book, I decided to subdivide it into a seven day email sequence. So my first idea was to put up some organic content, let's say on those forums that you can post organic content. And then that people that opted in, I would have them on an autoresponder seven day sequence so that they could learn more about the book. And at the end, they would, they would buy the book. But what I got was that although people did opt in, and they were interested because I could see the statistics from the email marketing responder, but none of them bought. What, would, what do we do here, Neil? So I have, uh, you know, this is the fourth book that I've written. And when I teach and speak about influencer marketing, 
I say, if everybody is talking about your brand, if you're a Coca-Cola or, you know, um, Prada or, you know, people already know your brand, um, there's already word of mouth about you in, in social media. And whenever I talk to small business owners and I ask them, how did you get big? They say word of mouth. So what social media does is it can amplify that word of mouth. But if nobody's talking about you, you got to get people talking about you, right? And therefore, my approach with my book is when I went to this, I went to a social media marketing world uh, in, in San Diego the first week of March. In the same week, I went to a, a convention called PodFest, which is actually a really great, you should go there sometime. It's, a, it's a, um, an indie podcast conference. And I literally was handing out books, right? I, because these are people that are really, these are influencers, they're content creators. And I wanted them, you know, I realized after publishing my first book that you're not going to make money on books, but it's a great business card and it's a great vehicle to build relationships with other people. And by giving them a book, there were many people, and I took a picture together with them, right? There are many people who posted those pictures on Instagram. Now there are people that are writing reviews for me on Amazon. And in, in the United States, the biggest seller of books is Amazon. It's, it's tremendously online. So I said, huh, I want to do my own influencer marketing strategy. I can reach out to influencers, but if my ROI is Amazon reviews, why don't I just reach out to people that have written Amazon reviews for similar books, right? And a lot of people use their name and I look at them on LinkedIn. It's like, wow, we're already connected. It's like, hey, you know, I appreciate the connection. I know you're a lover of marketing books. I'd love to send you my new book for free. You know, if you find it recommendable, I'd, I'd be honored by an Amazon review. So if you want to sell a thousand books, giving away 50 books is nothing, right? And that's sort of the approach. If you were to do a giveaway and you were to target salespeople and say, this is the latest book on, you know, whatever, um, you'll get 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 email addresses for the cost of 50 books. But you're, those books are going out to people that might share them with their communities as well. So I, um, I, I have a very, very different you know, philosophy. Like I said, I, I don't see book as a major revenue generator, but it gets your name out there. It's that business card. It builds credibility. And I, I want, I'm not going to do this forever, but for the first 30 days, I'm doing some aggressive you know, reaching out to people. There was a professor of, um, of personal branding at UCLA, for instance, last night. She reached out to me on Twitter, Neil, what happened to LinkedIn group statistics? And I said, oh, they don't offer them anymore. And I had actually taught at her class once at UCLA. I'm like, and she's an influence. I'm like, hey, Nance, I just came out with a new book. Would you like to read it? Send me your address. And people are thrilled, right? Especially with the pandemic, people have a lot of time at home. So they're thrilled to receive a free book. So there's, there's a lot of different ways to think about this, Diogo. There's no one right answer here. This is what works for me. But I literally put aside, you know, this box of 36 books, this is going to my Instagram followers. This box of 36 books is going to go to my, you know, Facebook followers or Facebook fans. And I plan to do separate, you know, week by week, do separate sort of campaigns to thank people, but also to acquire email addresses. And, and it's, it becomes a great promotion because you can boost that because you're giving something away. Now, in the United States, we have something called media mail. So first of all, the, the, the postal service has not stopped in the United States. We can still send books, right? Media mail is $2.80 to send a book in the United States. So for me, you know, I could spend $100 on ads or I could spend $100 to spend 30 books, to send 30 books to people that then two weeks later I can follow up with and say, what do you think about the book? Could I get a recommendation from you? You know, I already, I got my first blog post today of someone who, who I sent the book to, who read it, loved it reviewed on Amazon. Now, now it's on Google, right? So that's, you know, it's sort of just a different way of, of, of thinking about it. Um, but I, I think when you, when you do that, you make really, really raving fans of your brand. People that three months from now, if you're doing a webinar, they're going to want to sign up. And when you write your next book, they're going to be first in line and want to buy it. So that's, that's sort of my, and that's more of like a marketing than a sales because if I, if I told my boss this back in my sales days, he'd say, you smoking crack, what are you thinking? You got to get back, you got to build up your pipeline, right? So it's, it's a very, very different approach. But at the end of the day, you need to spend money to make money. And if you're not spending money, you're spending time and time is money in sales. So this helps you, I believe, accelerate that. And I believe it's a great ROI. But hey, I'm, you know, my last book was published in 2013 before Instagram. 
but I see it as an opportunity now. I'm not sending eBooks, only paper books. I want, I want people to take pictures, right? Um, so it's a different philosophy, but I think that at a minimum, you're gonna make a lot of people happy. You're gonna develop better relationships. Some of them are gonna share that book with their network on social. And I'll, I'll show you, you know what? One sec. I literally, I had these printed up really cheaply. These are postcards, right? And I put these in the book when I send it. You know, hey, um, three ways to engage uh, with Neil. Um, share a photo of yourself with the book and tag Neil Schaefer so that Neil can give you a shout out. Listen to his Maximize Your Social Influence podcast. Join Neil's membership community. And then, you know, help Neil and help others discover the age of influence by submitting a review to Amazon. So a very, very simple call to action. Um, and I personalize every, my wife hates it. But I, I personalize every book. I write their name. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for the connection or whatever it is, right? Congratulations. But I write that person's first name because in sales, you know, that personalization is key. So, um, you know, I do my best to get ROI out of it in a smart way. Um, but that's sort of, that's my strategy when it comes to books. This makes sense because now people are much more open to provide you backlinks. Oh, absolutely. And we can go even further. So, um, you know what? I can show you. You might be interested to see this, Diogo, and I know that you're going to have your fans. There are tools. Uh, I got a lot of tabs open here, so you're going to have to hold on. <laughs> no, that's fine. Take your time. Uh, it's about helping people. So, Indeed. This is my most recent favorite tool. So there's a tool that marketers use called blogger outreach tools because you mentioned SEO. I wanted to bring it up and let me just shoot campaigns here. Okay. So what this tool allowed me to do, okay. I, I I'm only using it right now. So I have a, for my book. Okay. I have all these different strategies and campaigns. So one of them is like the book giveaway and getting my books. The other one is I'm challenging myself to get onto 100 podcasts in the next 90 days. I just, I want to get the word out, right? And I think that podcasting is a great way to do it. So this is a tool called Respana. And uh, I'm actually doing a podcast interview today with the founder. But there are other tools that do this. They basically allow you to look up things in the internet, find the people that made them, and then send them an email. So I basically use this tool. In five minutes, it introduced me to 53 different podcasts about marketing and it already had the email address for those 53. So what happens is, um, hold on a minute here. Let me go into the campaign here. So basically it automates, I'm not a fan of automation, but I just wanna show this to you of what is possible. You know, and because you're a podcaster, Diogo, it's a lot easier for you. I'm a podcaster, do a search for my podcast to find mine. Your podcast, you know, do, do you collaborate with others by accepting guests? I just came out with a new book. You could be doing this exact same thing for sales podcasts, right? It sends it, if there's no reply one week later, hey, one time follow up. So I did this for the first time, Yoga. And all I can say is that of the 53 people, I've only sent it out to 44 so far. It was delivered to 100%, 63% of those people opened. 15% have already replied. I've already been on two podcasts because of this. And I sent it out like on Monday. So in the same way, let's do this live, okay? What, where I was going was the campaign title is um, sales. Well, I'm going to do for, for mine. Um, best marketing books. So I'm going to create this. And I'm going to do a search. And I'm going to look on the internet for, and you can do this manually, right? Go to Google, do a search, please select the source. Oh, uh, my source is going to be web search, just anything on the web. But you see here, I could just do podcasts if I wanted to. Um, I could just do blogs. I'm just going to do web. And immediately what this is going to show me, un momento. Um, <laughs> Hopefully it won't take too long. Come on. Okay, wow. It found a lot of results, obviously, because we're talking about the World Wide Web. Um, so it immediately says, um, you know, we can go by domain authority. They have a response score. 
So Amazon bestsellers in marketing, I'm not going to be able to get on this. Inc.com, there's no way, right? Um, this is Goodreads. But if we keep going down here, the eight best brand marketing books of 2 2 of 2020 um, from Balance, Optin Monster, 19 best marketing books. Bright Edge SEO, 17 best marketing. I'm just going to pick the best. This is Goodreads, so that's a social network. Um, the Balance Small Business, best marketing books. Uh, Invest Pro, uh, uh, I'll skip that one. 30 best marketing books for entrepreneurs. So I can pick these five. I press next. And um, you know, it, has, uh, it has all these different templates. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't save a template here. But I'm just going to go, um, yeah, content promotion. So this is what I showed you before, right? Um, I just finished reading. So it's going to put in the first name. And you know, I'm going to customize this, right? So let me just save it and let me move this over here. I'm going to go to the next step because ah, I'm not going to launch this. And then it's literally going to look for the contact information for each of these URLs. Oh, no. so it's like, okay, Emily, um, wait a minute here. Nothing was found. Hold on a minute here. Oh, none of these had contacts. Okay. Um, when I did it with podcast, Diogo, because every podcaster has, a, has an email address in their RSS feed, it picked it up. But you can basically buy, you can use Respondent to look up email addresses if I wanted to. Yeah. There are, as a salesperson, you know, on the online, there's tons of tools to find them, right? Um, but at least it finds out who are the people that wrote the post or that might be related. So um, uh, some of these are going to be easier than others. So, um, you know, we may want to go back to the blog post and make sure this is the same author um, or look them up on LinkedIn. But this is, you know, if I had their email addresses, I could then go to the next step, which is personalize each one if I wanted to, and then send it. And then it does everything for me and tracks if they opened it, if they clicked on it. And if they didn't open it a week later, it sends another email. So this is a sort of powerful thing that you could be doing for anything on the internet that has best sales books, right? I would definitely use a tool like this or manually look them up on, you know, on Google, LinkedIn and reach out to them. Hey, I saw you have a, 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 um, a blog post on best, um, uh, best sales books. I just came out with a new book. I think you're really going to like it. Can I send you a copy for consideration uh, to add to your blog? Um, that's the type of thing that, that you can be doing, um, you know, right now to try to encourage that. When you talked about backlinks, it sort of, it, it, it sort of rang a bell and, and the light bulb went on. I got a question for you. I'm a life insurance agent based in Portugal. I have my agency here and I'm working towards building my brand here. So it makes it easier for people to start trusting my brand and start acquiring these services from me. Either if it's someone that is buying life insurance or if it's agents looking for, looking for work and they start seeing me as a credible person to work with. The problem that I'm having is that in the past, I wanted to reach out to business leaders and worldwide influencers so I can learn from them. I find that in Portugal, people are much more close to come on podcasts. But in the US, it's the complete opposite. It's easier to get people that are re really reputable business leaders and influencers to come on a podcast. And I've learned that when you start having this momentum, it's easier to invite more people because they start seeing your track record. The problem that I'm having is that in order to maintain my worldwide presence, because I, I can help you with sales, I'm a salesperson, right? It's a, a worldwide thing. I can help everyone with sales. The problem that I'm having is that I find that I am doing two types of work, two different lines of work. And this is being a little bit of a trouble to me because I'm a focused guy and I find myself at two types of podcasts, two email marketing lists, two Facebook pages. It's a bunch of work and I'm finding some trouble dealing with this. Yeah, I think you, you've become a, a business that has two business units. One is Portugal life insurance, one is global sales. And, and you know, how much are you investing in one and how much revenue is that generating? How much are you investing in the other and how much revenue? What's the potential revenue for both? And yeah, it's a little crazy, but you need to maintain both to maintain a lifestyle. But at some point, you may need to shift investment. And what I mean by shift investment is, you know, you're still doing both, 
but you're finding greater ROI from, you know, Portugal life insurance. So maybe the podcast, instead of doing every week, you do every other week, right? And in, in decreasing the frequency or a blog post or of email, you know, you can at least try to maintain a balance of time spent based on the amount of money or potential money that you can make from each of these lines of business. There's, there's no easy way. I mean, if one takes off, I say just focus on one, right? Um, or you can, you know, I'm a big fan of hiring people online to help me. So there are, you know, business managers, there are project managers, there are internet, you know, marketers around the world that can help manage those sites for you. Especially if it's, a, if it's an English sales site, there's tons of people that probably have experience working on English sales sites as, as content writers or what have you. So that may be where you want to start to scale and delegate some of those tasks that require a lot of time to other people that can help you. Taking on from this, you have a new book coming out. What made you write the book? Well, you know, I wrote this book the same reason why you wrote your book is customer demand. I was getting lots of questions about influencers and I realized that there were very few good books out on the subject and um, there were a lot of people being miseducated about it. So I wanted to, I, I really think it's a powerful, um, it's a powerful form of marketing that every business should be doing, but most aren't. Uh, and they have a stigma or they have these, you know, misconceptions. So I wanted to clear that out. I mean, from a personal branding, I think if you're like an author and a speaker, you need to have new books every few years. It had been six years since my last book. So I thought it was good timing, actually, well, six and a half years. So I thought it was very good timing as well. Um, and I thought that that would actually lead to more business, which it has in, in different ways. Um, hey, you have a new book. You should definitely speak at our conference or, hey, you know, uh, we'll, we'll buy a few boxes of books if you come and, you know, consult with us, whatever it is, right? So, um, and, and, and it's helped my branding as being sort of still at the forefront of, of, you know, thought leadership and marketing. So a lot of different reasons, but that topic really was because of that, that demand I saw. And every book I've written has really been about the demand that I see from my customers. So I don't care what you think about influencer marketing, but those people and customers that I have relationships with and those people that have attended my events and asked me questions, I'm serving them. We need to serve our communities, right? Um, and the best way I can serve them is at, at that point was to write this book and get that information out there so that they can take action. Your book is available on Amazon and all platforms. It, it wasn't self-published. It was published with HarperCollins and they published Gary Vaynerchuk's book. So I assume if you can find Gary V's books, you'll be able to find my book, hopefully. But yeah, online, definitely everywhere. Going back, advice to your younger self, what would you say? Um... I would say to be more strategic and more intentional. So I tend to be a busybody. I'm always busy, right? I mean, I was even a little bit late to this interview because I, I'm always trying to like get the maximum amount of stuff done in a limited amount of time. And that work ethic, I think, comes from spending the first 15 years of my career in Japan where we were all workaholics, right? Um, but I think that... Um, if there's a direction you want to go with your life, if three months from now you want to be here or one year from now you want to be there, you need to plan it out. You need to create a strategy. You need to align yourself with it because if you don't do that, you're never going to get there. So I, I, my motto for my life is no regrets. I have no regrets over any of the choices I've made and I've, I've had great experiences. But perhaps in this few years where I didn't write a book and I thought I should, but I didn't, I should have just taken a step back and looked more strategically as to the value of doing that and really planned it out where, where I might have written the book a little bit earlier. Um, once again, no regrets. It's actually the market's not changed. The need is still there. And it really challenged me to write the book to be as evergreen as possible. If someone was reading this five years from now, it still has to be relevant. So I learned a lot and I, th I think I created a better book from that. But that is what, um, yeah. And, and the other thing that I would teach a younger self as an entrepreneur is, and this goes back to my advice I was giving you, Diogo, is hire, hire, hire people, delegate, delegate, delegate. And my father was a successful entrepreneur. And when I talked to his accountant, he goes, Neil, first question, Neil, how many people you have working for you? Right? He goes, your dad was successful because early on he was able to hire people. And I thought, well, I'm a social media strategist because I, I, I can't, the only way I can hire people is to like replicate myself. But indeed, when I look through my list of tasks that I do on a daily basis, there was a lot that I could delegate, right? And I started doing that. And I built up a staff of, of you know, I don't have full-time employees, but I have different people I use for different tasks, some for my own brand, some for my clients. 
And it's helped me move on to things that are more strategic, which has then helped me meet some of those strategic goals I have. And that is something that I think we can all never hear enough of. I am going to be taking my own advice. I wanted to move more digitally for the last few years. And it's been my goal to create those sorts of digital courses and digital membership communities. And, you know, I was very early on in, in, in internet, in, well, in social media marketing, you know, uh, I published my book, my first book about a year after Lewis Howes published his book, but he realized the power of webinars. And then he realized the power of a digital course called Link Influence. And he has just taken off from there and he's become an absolute rock star. And I never realized because I worked, my background is corporate sales. You know, I, I didn't, I wasn't as tuned into that digital economy. I didn't think people wanted to spend a thousand dollars on a course digitally. And I, I didn't want to make money from people. I wanted to serve businesses. But over time I realized there's so many people buying these courses. I had one guy on Instagram say, Neil, I went to your site, but why don't you have any courses? So, you know, I want to serve people. People want to learn from me, but they don't want to necessarily hire me as a consultant because that's not how it's done today. They, they take digital courses or, you know, they read books, what have you. So um, I've been wanting to do this for a while and I actually committed to doing this. I think within the next month or two, I'll be launching it. So I want to have, you know, a digital membership community with, you know, weekly group coaching um, and teaching and then create a digital course. And I, I have ideas for like, you know, a dozen different diff digital courses and I'm going to let that community decide what content I should develop into a course. So by the end of the year, hopefully I'll have a community and I'll have digital courses and that'll help me sort of stabilize my revenue, not just because of the pandemic, but when, you know, speaking gigs come, come and go, that there's ebbs and flows. When, when there's a month I don't have speaking gigs, I'll know that I'll still have, you know, passive revenue from that. So that's my goal. So, you know, I, I, uh, I'm acting on what I, I you know, I'm, I'm walking the walk and talking the talk. And that's why I'm so passionate about trying to help other businesses move digitally as well. You can tell that, especially when you are a salesperson, you can read people better. You feel their passion. You can tell when they have a good vibe. Oh, thank you. I feel really, you know, I, I, you know, I find that I am an educator. You know, I, I'm not a consultant. I'm an educator. If, if a company wants to hire my agency, I also want to teach you best practices as part of that, right? Sure, you'll pay me, but I want you to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. And uh, I just, I mean, you know, we, I, I want to contribute. I mean, and that's the meaning of life is, is helping make the people around you a better life. So um, that, that's my little way of doing it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the more people I help, the better it makes me feel, the more passion I get about what I do. So uh, that's what it's all about. And, you know, I, I know that, you know, salespeople don't always have the best recognition in society, but I believe that, you know, every salesperson is the same. They're, they're out there tr generally trying to help people, right? And when I look around, when I go somewhere and I look around in a building, I'm like, yep, for every, every light I see here, every item I see on the shelf, there was a salesperson who sold that, who convinced someone to actually buy that, that light fixture or that door or that window, right? Um, and it's, it's an incredible career. It's, and it's not just, you know, the psychology of being able to read people and serving people, but it's also quite the art, right? Every salesperson has to be an artist. You got to paint a different picture for every person you meet. So it's an incredibly... Uh, it's an incredible career um, that I'd recommend to anybody. Finally, where can people get a hold of you if they want to learn more? Sure. So I am Neil Schaefer, uh, N-E-A-L-S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R, uh, everywhere. So neilschafer.com, uh, you know, Neil Schaefer, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, what have you. Uh, my book is called The Age of Influence, so it should be sold everywhere. I, I actually have quite a few um, uh, European customers that, that have already received the book. Uh, that have already bought the book. So um, you should be able to see it. I, I even had someone from uh, St. Petersburg uh, email me last night that they bought the book. So it's, I assume if you can buy it in Russia, you can buy it anywhere in Western Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, the other places I do have my own podcast called Maximize Your Social Influence, which is all about helping marketers, entrepreneurs, and small business owners build, leverage, and monetize influence in digital and social media. So it, it, I talk about everything we talked about here, Diogo, but I, I, you, I put this lens of influence, right? Uh, this perspective on everything we do in sales and marketing. So if you're in the podcast, hopefully you'll check that out. It was cool having you with us today. We'll speak soon. Yes, thank you, Diogo. It was awesome.